Let's see how far through chapter 17 we get today in Genesis. Last week I intended to try to cover into at least part of the way into 18, and we didn't get any farther than 8 verses in 17, so um, we'll see how we do today. I'm not making any promises. Chapter 17 in Genesis. So just for a review, we'll just back up to verse 1 and, and read and try to get a running start at this. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to, to when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations. I will, make, <clears throat> I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make, your, make nations of you. The kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be, uh, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in, in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan uh, as an everlasting possession, I will, and I will be their God. And God said to Abram, Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout your, their generations. This is my covenant, <clears throat> which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants. Uh, after you, every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall uh, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be as a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money uh, from a foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be with your shall be in your flesh for everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. All right. So <clears throat> Last week, when we were getting into this, we see Abram, 99 years old, uh, and the Lord just appears to him. Now, he's, he's had conversations with the Lord already in the past. He's received the covenant already. He's 99 years old. He's going to be 100 years old when Isaac is born. And remember, God and, or God, Abram and Sarai tried to help God out and said, surely he must have meant I mean, he said he would come, the, the child would come from you, but he didn't say he would come from me, so here, take Hagar. Maybe that's what God meant, right? And, and that created a whole other problem that is still prevalent today. But um, God told him, it's not going to come from Ishmael, right? This is not the, the son of promise, But he just shows up here at this point and he just says, I am almighty God. And we talked about that for a long time because it really means sufficient. It's El Shaddai. I'm the all-sufficient one. Everything you need, Abram, everything that you're desiring, every, every promise I've made is going to be provided for by me. Everything that we have is from God. Whether you think you have a little, whether you think you have a lot, it's from God. If you keep that mindset, you keep that perspective, it helps us to deal with life a, a lot better. It helps us to be willing to live life and to be content in what we have and who we are and where we are. Contentment is a hard thing to, to get a hold of, isn't it? We're always worried about the next bill. We're always worried about the next 
meal. We're always worried about the next car or the repair on the car that we have. So we're our, in government and what our government's doing. We're worried about what world leaders are doing. And we've talked a lot, especially in the last couple of years, about hope because the world and, and Satan through it is trying to crush everyone's hope. We, they want everyone to walk around and be hopeless so that they can rise up and say, see, put your hope and your trust in me, I'll be your provider. And God is saying, no, I'm the provider. I'm sufficient for you. However much you have, however little you have, that's enough. Right? Understand, I am, God is, more than enough. If we will look at that and we will look to him, we're always looking to the future then, aren't we? Because we know that our future is with him. It's not here. It's not in a system. It's not in, a, in an operation. It's not in a job. It's not in a relationship with any man or woman. Our hope, our future is with him. It's in him. And he has secured it. And, and, and we saw how it's going to end. We know our final destination. We don't know all the details of it. But we know what it is. We saw that when we were going through Revelation. We saw it at the end of Revelation. We know it going through the Gospels. He's promised. He's made a lot of promises to us in the Gospels. He fulfilled prophecies in his own life from his birth to his death and, and resurrection and his, and his burial. All of those things prophesied in great detail that he fulfilled. He is the all-sufficient one and so almighty I'm not telling you to, to line that out and put sufficient there. They're synonymous with one another. If he can make promises and, and fulfill those promises and make great promises, he's not making a small promise to Abram. This is, you're going to have all of this land. You're going to be the father of many nations. Every, every nation on the face of the earth will one day be blessed by you and through you. And anybody who blesses you in return will be blessed by me, and anybody who curses you in return will be cursed by me. If they are your friend, they're my friend. And the opposite of that should be true as well, right? If, if God is truly our friend, then Israel should be our friend. And Abram's response is to fall on his face not fall on his face and talk, but fall on his face and let God speak to him. Not to jump up and run around, not to make a bunch of declarations himself, not to... His worship as his friend. And, and, and listen, in the, in the New Testament, it says that God, or Abram was a friend of God. But this isn't good old buddy friends. This is a, a friendship full of Great respect and honor. That's, that's what Abram has for God. They're not sitting around, you know, throwing one back, being good old boys. That's not what they're doing. That's not being a friend with God. Is not just being his buddy. It's to have great honor and respect for him. You know, like you do, hopefully you have a friend that you know. If you're in trouble, you can call any time, day or night, and they're going to be there to help you. That's the kind of friend that we are to be with God, that we are, that God is really to us. That we would go to him with every need we have. That we would put our faith and trust in his word. You have friends who, if they tell you something, you know they're going to follow through with it. It, it, that's who God is. That's being a friend of God. It, it drives me kind of a little bit crazy when I hear people say, yeah, me and the big man upstairs. Have more respect and reverence for the one who created you than that. If that's your opinion of God and you think you can work out your own private deal with him, you don't know God. 
If it doesn't, thinking about him and being in his presence doesn't cause you to want to get on your face and hide your face from him, you're not in a good relationship with God. People say, well, we shouldn't have any fear of God. We shouldn't be afraid to go to him. We can go boldly before the throne. That doesn't mean you get to go bragging and arrogant before the throne. It means you can have great confidence that when you go to the throne, God will hear you. You don't have to be afraid to offer and to pray and and to praise and worship him. it's, It's to have and understand we have his grace and we have his mercies, like we read in the psalm this morning. His mercies are poured out on us. And listen, you go through the Psalms and you see how the psalmist, the different psalmists prayed. They prayed very honestly. But that was because they they had a, a relationship with God that was not just following rules. It wasn't just bringing the right sacrifice. All those things were important. Very important, but it's not all it was. So they could pray like David would pray, bash out the teeth of my enemies. Or like we saw this morning in in Psalm 6. You deal with my enemies. And even to say in in that, I mean, when we read that Psalm, we know there are some things about it that uh, maybe don't, in in our own minds, without really thinking about it too much, just on a whim, maybe didn't sound quite right. Like, who praises you in death? Who thanks you when, you, when they die? Well, we know what's going to happen when we die. That was obviously somebody who, who wrote that. I believe it was David who wrote that, who uh, was just making his heart known before the Lord. In my opinion, God, it, it revived me. Don't leave me here like this. I think I could do more for you if I stay alive than if I die. And that moment in his life didn't have a, a, a great perspective, wasn't thinking about eternity with God. But when we back up and we see other Psalms as well, David would back up and see and understand that he was going to be with God for eternity, in his presence for eternity. And we see other Psalms where David's heart is right before the Lord and he's worshiping God with all of his heart. So yeah, we we have moments and and we have such a secure relationship with God that we can vent with him. He's big enough to handle that. But be ready to be submissive as well. That after the venting, what comes next is repentance, maybe of the wrong heart in which we vented, or maybe repentance of our own actions, and then worship, and worship again. But to worship God like Abraham does, he, he, he didn't see himself as an equal. Sometimes I think that that's when we start talking about being a friend of God, we start elevating ourselves a little too much to the point where it almost sounds like we're an equal with God. But an equal with God, Abraham, or Abram, fell on his face. An equal doesn't, doesn't stand up and hold his head up and be arrogant or be that kind of, of bold. Instead, he falls on his face and lets God talk to him. And that's what we need to do. We need to let God talk to, to us. We need to understand who we go before. Right? When, the, when the disciples ask, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And it's amazing to me that that's what they asked for. They didn't say, teach us how to heal. They didn't say, teach us how to preach. They said, teach us how to pray. What's the right way to approach God? And be careful if you go and you study out the Lord's Prayer, because there are people out there who twist some things and make it what it's not. They'll tell you, There's no sickness in heaven. So when you say, 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven, so there shouldn't be any on earth. You should be able to just pronounce healing on anybody and everyone. And it's, certainly you should pray for people. You should lay hands on them. You should anoint them with oil. The Bible tells us to do those things. But that's a prayer of submission. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And the, the, the rationality of saying, well, there's no sickness in heaven, so there shouldn't be any on earth. There's no marriage in heaven. Right? We're not going to be marrying or given in marriage. So, so we're not having more weddings in heaven. Should we have them on earth then? I mean, that's the kingdom of heaven, right? Are we out of God's will when we do that? Their, their rationale for that little piece that they put in there. And they're not, you probably can figure out who I'm talking about, but they're not the only ones who do that. There are others who take other places in that prayer and twist it around. We, we quote that section of scripture like it's the prayer to quote. It's a teaching of how to pray, how to present yourself before God. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. To go and to be before him with fear and reverence and honor and remembering where he is and who he is. Give us today our daily bread, what we need for today. Can you be content with what you need just for today and not worry about tomorrow? I mean, Jesus does a whole teaching on that too, right? You can't add one single cubit to your height worrying about tomorrow. You can't add a, any increment of measure to your height because you worry about it. Abram sets a great example of what it means to be a friend of God, to be one who, who trusts in his word, who has trusted him with his life, and is willing to not go before God and just talk and put out a list, but sit and listen, even in a position of reverence and submission. It says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. I'm not even sure how many times this is. Three, four times, maybe fifth time that God has reiterated his promise to Abram. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is the land you're going to possess. And listen, we talked about this last week. They've never possessed everything that they were given, ever. At the height of the land that they possessed, it was only like 10%. In the millennial kingdom, they'll have it all. If you look on a map, in, in one of the uh, promises back a chapter or two, it was from the river Euphrates to the river of Egypt. That's huge. That's a huge amount of land that Israel is going to have. The some of the land that's occupied by their enemies right now, or in, in some of them, I want to enter into relationships with them now. So, uh, in normalized relations with, with, the, with Israel, but maybe, so maybe not enemy, just neighbor, we could call some of them. Which is also a fulfillment of prophecy, by the way. It's shaping up to that. But that land of Jordan, some of Syria, Lebanon, uh, there's a lot that actually belongs to Israel that God will one day fulfill. They'll, when he sets up his kingdom, I believe that'll be all theirs. And Abraham, I believe Abraham believed it. It says, no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. So he goes from 
exalted father. And for a long time, he didn't have any kids, only, and then only had Ishmael. But at least then he could kind of hang on to the tag of exalted father a little bit. Got one. But God says, no, I'm going to change your name. Because it's more than just one descendant you're going to have. More than, more than one here. I'm telling you, I'm going to make nations out of you. So you're going to be the father of nations. That's what Abraham means. And I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make, your, I will make nations out of you, or of you, and kings shall come from you. Did kings come from Abram, Abraham? We've got a whole list of them, don't we? Now we know as we go through the rest of the books of the law, it wasn't really God's intent. He wasn't really what he wanted, that they would have kings, but that they would always only look to him to be their king. But they did not. And even here with Abram, or Abraham, in this covenant, he's telling them, this is what they're going to want. And this is what they're going to have. And it wasn't always great for them. How many good kings can you name out of the, the line of Abraham? When you read through First and Second Samuel, when you read through First and Second Chronicles, especially First and Second Kings, how many kings did they have that served the Lord? Not very many. None when they split into to, to two nations, and you had Israel to the north, and you had ten nations up there, and you had Judah to the south, and you just had Judah and Benjamin there. The southern kingdom is the only one that had any good kings after Solomon. The kings to the north in Israel had no good king, not one that walked with the Lord. And so they were taken into captivity way before the southern kingdom was taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. But after Solomon... You have Jehoshaphat, who was not a super solid, but he was good. You have Josiah, Hezekiah, but there aren't a lot. Which tells us that God is patient. Not only does he fulfill his promises, but he is patient with us. He was patient with his people in their abuse of his promise, and he's patient with us. So we have the fulfillment of that. Kings came from him. And I will, verse 7 And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations forever, an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Now Israel still worships not, not as a, a whole. They're really a very liberal country. They're, not, they're like a microcosm of the United States. They're, they're, everything wrong with us is pretty much wrong in Israel as well. And yet God still blesses them. They're still better at what they do than we are. Part of our problem is we're leaving our friendship with them, but nonetheless, he stays their God. Israel being out of the land, being dispossessed of their land by Rome for, what, 2,000 years? Ballpark. Right around 2,000 years. They're dispossessed. They come back into the land. It's still their land. They still have the same religion, even though they were dispersed all over the world. They still worship the same God. They still have the same Bible. They still have their, they maintain their language. I mean, this Hebrew today is not exactly the same as it was in ancient Israel, but English today is not what it was 200 years ago. It's not what it was 50 years ago. but his promise that they will have this land, the promise that he will be their God, whether they want him to or not, I will be their God. This is not, they're going to make me their God. I will be their God. And he, he maintains this. He, 
he can chastise them. He can discipline them. He can put them into a bondage situation with another country, be dispersed throughout the world. He can do because he is their God. Right? They didn't go into Babylon because they wanted to. He put them there to bring them back again. He did what he would do. He said he would do certain things. He would hold them to his covenant. Not to theirs, not to Abraham's covenant. To God's covenant. His promise. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is never going to get away from them, Abraham. What I do, what I command, what I give them, the orders that I give, that will never get away from them. As off as they would be, as far away from God as they would walk, we still have our Bible, God's word, maintained and written down and maintained all of these generations through this one nation. There has always been a faithful remnant in Israel. There is today. They're part of the church today. And when the rapture happens and the church is taken out of the way, there will be another remnant that will backfill it. The 144,000 will start with them. I don't know, I don't remember if we talked about, how much we talked about that when we went through Revelation, but you think about it. That 144,000 won't get saved until the church is gone. So all the details that go into that, that group of people who start off and are spread out and get the message out to the rest of the known world at that time, 144,000 don't know him yet, won't know him until the church is gone. But God, and he, you know, those two words right there go together in every aspect of our life. I do this, I mess this up, I, but God. But God. Right? But God in his great wisdom, in his great mercy, in his great grace. And I, I have said, and I speak from experience, if you have truly given your heart to the Lord and you go rogue, <laughs> you become a prodigal, you're going to be one of the most miserable people on the face of the planet until you come home. But it's still your home. And when you finally repent, he's not going to say, oh, look, I got another son. Oh, look, I have another daughter. He's going to say, my child has come home. You, have, you are his child. You've always been his child. You know it in your heart. You can't get away from him. And you'll come home. And so if you're praying for one, pray that way, with that kind of faith, with that kind of, of assurance in your heart. God has made a covenant with us, a blood covenant. And everyone who has truly given their heart to the Lord belongs to him. And he says in verse 10 there, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Good news. That's not great news, I don't think. <clears throat> so everyone had to be circumcised on the eighth day. Everyone who was born or descended from Abram or Abraham, every single one of them, and, and including those who were, who were bought, so his servants, anybody who came in, into his house to serve, all of them had to be circumcised. And I'm going to challenge you to chase circumcision through the New Testament. There's a lot of negative said about the physical act of circumcision and that the Jews wanted to force circumcision on all believers. Right? You have to be circumcised. And yet the mindset was that Christians were still a sect of Judaism. 
So not only did you have to believe in Jesus, but you had to come in to Jewishness, right? You had to be a Jew. You had to come into Judaism as well. And it wouldn't have been a far stretch in the mind of some because baptism was one of the last things you did as a Gentile converting to Judaism. You went and you were baptized. The idea was that you are now entering into this new covenant, this new relationship with God, as innocent as you were the day you were born. That's what baptism is all about. Right? We, we know every year at Passover, I go through this, we, they would go down to a mikvah uh, when they were going to do something important like engagement or, or betrothal more properly. They would, they would uh, <clears throat> apart from one another, not, not together, but the, the man, the woman, they would go down into these mikvahs, these little pools of water, and they would go in naked. They were, they were small, so they had to kind of go into the fetal position until they were completely submerged and covered and come out. And the idea was you were entering into this covenant, this promise, whatever it was, whatever it was going to be, as innocent as the day you were born. That's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again? And Jesus said, you're the teacher in Israel. You don't understand this? You should know. The picture is right in front of you. You've done it yourself, Nicodemus. The whole idea there. right? And so to, to, when you converted to Judaism, it was one of the last things that you did. So then to jump from that to then believers had to be circumcised, well, that was part of being Jewish. Was, you could convert or born. Didn't matter. And so they started trying to put this on the church. And, and of course, we go through Paul's letters and we see many times he had to confront this and say, no, that's not, that's not what that's about. And he talked about the circumcision of the heart or the circumcision of the flesh. And this is, you know, to, to us, to believers, to Christians, this is an outward sign of God's promise, right, to Abraham. Th this was to be a remembrance for him. And to all who came after them, this was the promise God made. Because I'm telling you, if you're anybody from Ishmael on up, any, any kid, anybody who's old enough to talk, and Abraham says to you, hey, uh, God spoke to me, changed my name, and now he wants this covenant, and he's gonna, we have to carry this covenant around as a sign to us. And, you know, somebody might be thinking, you know, Noah had a sign of his covenant that God was never going to flood the earth again and destroy the earth with water, but his covenant's in the sky, not in his body. Why, why do we have to do this? This doesn't, you know, listen, it's a blood covenant. Just like our being saved comes from a blood covenant. Jesus shed blood on the cross, and we are to cut away the flesh of our hearts, our flesh, and follow him and worship him. In the, the, the moment of our salvation, we should always be able to look back on and see that's the moment that God's promise was, was given to me and fulfilled in me. That there would be a redeemer, that there would be a, a salvation would come. We should be able to look at his word and see God's promises and say, there it is. That's the moment that my flesh fell off when I gave my heart to the Lord. This is a moment when every man is going to understand. Abram would have answered, this is the promise God has made. This is the sign God has given to all of my descendants, everyone who comes after me. And because I believe him, we're going to carry out this commandment. Why the eighth day? He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Why wait eight days? Well, we know part, and listen, this isn't where circumcision started. There were other cultures around them. This was a known thing. The Egyptians circumcised, some of the other cultures circumcised. Even later as you go on, the Romans circumcised. They, they knew what this was. And, and so part of it, we know, is a health benefit. 
But why the eighth day? Because in a man's body, in a, in a boy's body, on the eighth day, everything is there for him to be able to survive a cut. Everything has developed and in, in progressed in his body. Not to the seventh day, the eighth day. On the eighth day, he has now the ability to clot and not bleed to death from this kind of wound. It happens on the eighth day. So God said, hey, do it on the eighth day. And maybe it happens on the seventh day. God says, all right, new beginning, eighth day. I don't know. But by the eighth day, every male has the ability for his blood to clot and not die from this. So that's why the time. And this is to be a sign. Every man is going to carry in his body a sign that, well, of God's promise. This is the beginning of the promise. This is the beginning of, of being Jewish. This is the beginning of being a Hebrew. Now, obviously, Ishmael is going to be circumcised, and he, he won't be a Hebrew. He's not the son of promise. But it begins in this household. This is a part of my house. You are a part of my house to every male adult. You are a part of my household, and my house will serve God. Joshua would say a similar thing to those who were following him as they entered into the promised land, coming back home after 400 years of being in Egypt, after 40 years of being in the desert, waiting for a non-believing generation to die off, when they would go in, when they would begin to conquer the land, when they would get to the end, they had doled out the, the promise, they had given everybody their portion of the, pro, of the land. And Joshua would say, take the idols that you brought with you out of Egypt. How do you not lose those along the way? That, when I look at it, these idols that you brought, get rid of them. And serve the Lord. And when they would say, oh, we're going to serve the Lord, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua kind of gets a little sarcastic. Uh-huh. Sure you are. You do today. You choose this day. Make this a moment to remember. You choose this day who you're going to serve. Whether it is God or whether it is those idols. As for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua didn't say, as for me and everybody who decides in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He said, this is it. I'm committing my home, my house, my life, and everybody who comes after me represents that life. We're going to serve the Lord. He's saying, there's, there's not a little bitty idol going to be in, in, anywhere hidden in my home. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise. And I won't allow my household to compromise. Does that mean that Joshua's family beyond him never sinned, never did anything wrong, that Joshua himself was perfect from that moment on? No. But the intent of his heart, the desire of his heart, was to serve God and serve him alone and to be the example and to be the mouthpiece for God in his own house. To serve God. And Joshua had seen it all from the rebellion of people, right? He was one of the 12 spies. As he comes into that land, he is not just the only one from that generation left. There's only one other, Caleb. And they were the only two out of those 12 spies that came back and said, yes, there's giants, but God has given this into our hands. He has promised. He promised Abraham. He has promised us along the way. We can do this. God will, he has said, he'll drive out our enemies. Mm -hmm. 
we need to make some strong decisions, some hard decisions. There are always areas in our life that we need to reevaluate and say, am I serving the Lord here? Have I given this to him? Am I honoring him? Right? Do, you, do we have a closet somewhere, a, a hole or, or a corner back in a dark basement? Do we have some place we haven't given God? Where we hide things or, or whatever that we, we say, you know what? Just in case I decide he's okay with this. Or just as a remembrance of how God delivered me, I'm going to hang on to this. Guys, if you have anything like that, don't hang on to it. Get rid of it. You're going to say, well, you're starting to sound like those guys that told us to burn all of our albums or CDs or books or whatever else. Get rid of all of it. Man, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. If you need to blow your computer up, Blow it up. Just call me when you're going to do what I want to watch. Right? I mean, seriously. We've got these little things we hold in our, in our hands. Those are our life now. If you don't think that's your life, what happens when you lose it or misplace it? And you, you tell your wife or one of your kids, call my phone. Oh, no, I had it on silent. Oh, no, the battery was dead. Now what am I going to do? Or uh, you leave it at a restaurant. Or you, you know, it falls down between the seats in the car and you can't find it for a day and you're in a panic. Because I'm not connected. Are we connected to God that way? If you lost your Bible, would you know? If you misplaced it, couldn't find it on Sunday morning? Or would you say, ah, oh, you know, Glenn's got a bunch of them in his office, or we got some on the back table, we got some. I'll just use one of those. And listen, I, I'm not trying to shame anybody. I've walked out, come in this door right here, and gone, ah, oh, I left my Bible sitting on the counter. And I'm the pastor. I'm the one who's got to teach. That's why I keep the old ones back there. <laughs> so I, I know. I don't have to panic. I know there's one sitting back there I can use. You're lucky you haven't had a King James Sunday. I've got one or two of those back there. Listen, he's made promises. There are things that we do, like we're going to take communion today, that are remembrances. They're not just religious acts. Sometimes when we call these things sacraments, the idea is for it to be sacred to us, right? To, to really mean something. But even that word becomes just another Christian word. This just becomes another thing that we do because we're Christians. And, and it's just a thing we do. And we, we've so cheapened it that people who aren't believers can come up and don't have to feel uncomfortable. In fact, they probably feel more uncomfortable if they stayed in their seat. And good. But if you don't believe, don't take it. And I'm not saying, hey, if you haven't been walking with the Lord, good. You haven't been praying enough, you haven't been reading your Bible enough, then don't take it. I don't think that's right either. If you need to ask God to forgive you of something before you come and take, then do that and then come and take it because you know what this stands for. It stands for forgiveness, right? That's part of it. The grace and mercy of God. You ask him to forgive you and run up here and grab it. He's made us promises. All who come to me I will not turn away a single one. You love God because he first loved you. He didn't love you because you love him. You love him because he loves you. You haven't been able to forgive people in your life because you're just so a great person and that's who you are. 
You're able to forgive people, truly forgive in your life because God has forgiven you and, and you know that and you understand what that meant. You understand what it took to have God's for forgi his forgiveness. And so you should forgive, right? To whom much is given, much is required. It's not easy. It's hard. Great hurts, great pains, offenses, abandonments, abuses. Everything that our Savior experienced that night at his arrest, going to the cross, on the cross, until he said, it's finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then it says he died. He breathed his last. And because he loved us, he only stayed in that grave for three days and then he came back. Because I came, he said, to give you life. Not to give you death. He didn't make these promises to Abraham and just to put chains on him. He made these promises to Abraham to say, see, I control life. I control where people live. I control what's going on. Even when it seems like things are falling apart, they're coming together. In his hands, it's all falling into place. I have marked this out for you. This will be yours. This will be the descendants or the, the land of your descendants. And I will be their God. I promise to not abandon Israel. Now, he's not calling it Israel now. Abraham's descendants. I won't abandon them. I won't abandon this place. This is mine to give to them. They will be my people. I will be their God. I won't abandon them. God has not abandoned you. He's not forgotten you. Not even for a moment, no matter what. No matter what you've experienced, God has not forgotten you. The uncircumcised, verse 14, we'll jump down to there. The uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The idea there is they have rejected God, so they do not come under the promise. It's the same for today. God has offered a promise on his terms. Men don't like his terms. They don't like his salvation. They don't like his way out of hell. We're going to... However that is. Well, guess what? If you're not willing to circumcise the flesh of your heart like God has said, you don't want to throw off your old life. You don't want to throw off your sin. You don't want to conform to him. You don't want to embrace his promise to you. Then you've made your decision. And the idea here is the person who refused to be circumcised had made his decision <clears throat> and broken the covenant, broken the promise. Then God said to Abraham, for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah shall be her name. Not only Abraham at 99 years old and your wife not far behind you. Not only are you going to be the father of nations. Not only are kings going to come from you, but I'm changing your wife's name. She's your princess. That's what it means. That's what Sarah means, princess. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. So this takes the promise out of Ishmael, out of that hand, doesn't it? Even though God has promised Ishmael, and we'll see if we ever get to the end of this chapter, we'll, we'll see that God has made promises to Israel. But he's saying here, this is going to come from your wife, from Sarah, from your princess. Guys, <clears throat> our wives should be our princess. 
We should treat them like royalty. Their father, big dude. You don't want to mess with him. Right? <laughs> if I'm not treating my wife, if I don't look at her as a princess, if I'm not doing what I need to do for her, I got to answer to her dad. And that, that's not good to get called into that office. There's a blessing for her. This is a blessing to her. Now, ladies, I don't know about you, but at her age, do you really want to have another baby? Hey, would you, if God said, hey, you're going to have, you're going to have a son who's going to come from your own body, your old body. I'm gonna, she, it's no wonder she laughs. Right? I mean, you're looking at it as a blessing. I remember when we found out about Emma. Panic. Panic attack. Literally for Tracy. We find out just before or right after you turned 40. Just before. 40th birthday was right around the corner. And she called me into the bathroom like, what's going on? And she had been breathing into a bag. <laughs> and there, there. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <clears throat> Lord, no, man. Remember this deal we made? Say, I've done that too. Remember the deal we made? By 35, I'm done. Not 42. Not 56, I'm still not done. But it, it was a blessing. It is a blessing. I'm not sure at 99 I want to have another kid, but you know. I don't, <laughs> especially not from, right? She says, no, you take it up with the Lord. Anyways, I get myself in all kinds of trouble if I keep going down that road. <clears throat> Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said, in his heart shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old, and shall Sarah, who is 99 years old, <laughs> bear a child? 99 when she gives birth. Come on. Now, seriously, if God said this was going to happen, wouldn't you, wouldn't you laugh? I mean, really? I mean, I'd laugh. I'd laugh. You'd cry? I'd be like, no, nope, somebody else is raising this kid anyways. I'm about going home. So <laughs> I don't got to go through the teenage years with this one. I don't got to. Well, he had an older kid. He just picked on him and got kicked out. Remember that deal? We'll get to that. He had servants. He had lots of servants. Anyways, Abraham falls on his face and laughs. Now, when we see Sarah laugh, and we're not going to get to that today, but when we see Sarah laugh, when, when the Lord comes back to visit Abraham, when she laughs, her laugh is different. It's not a laugh of joy. He thinks this is hilarious, right? He's, he's like, this is amazing. This is... Hers is a scoffing laugh. Yeah, right. Right? I'm going to have a baby at 99. Come on. He says, and, and maybe he thinks about Sarah here in verse 18. I got to get wrap this up. And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. <laughs> Don't do this to Sarah. <laughs> Anyways, then God said, no, Sarah, your wife will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, which means laughter. She calls his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah your whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So God so Abraham, I'm sorry. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. 
and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his, and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house born uh, in the house or bought with the money, with money for, from a foreigner were circumcised with him. There's a lot of repetition there. I think the author wants to say, wants us to know, every detail of this was followed by Abraham. He didn't leave anything out. Everybody who was supposed to went through the process. He got, God had put it in Abraham's heart to follow him in all, with all of his heart. And he, and he led his house. By example, led his house. I would venture to say Abraham was probably the first one to go. And at 99 years old, so we're not too old to follow the Lord. We're not too old to throw off the old ways. This whole idea of you can't teach an old dog new tricks, yeah, you can. When you put him in front of God, you can. Us old dogs, we can learn new tricks. We can put off the old stuff. We can't, we, we can't go around saying, I'm just so set in my ways that God will just use that in spite of He will. He'll do it in spite of you. But you don't get to say, I don't have to change. You don't get to say, God's stuck with what he got. You walk before the Lord like Abraham walked before the Lord. Remember how this chapter started. I'm almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Not I'm almighty God, walk before me and hang on to a few things. So we're going to now take communion. And before you do, I encourage you, take a moment, pray, ask God, what needs to change in me? Be like David. Search me, Lord. If there's any wicked thing, show me. And let today, like the day of Abraham's circumcision, like the day of your salvation, let today be the day that you let go and let communion be between you and God in a, in a very intimate way. Today is the day. Whatever it is, today is the day that was marked as this thing is gone from my life. I have laid this down at his feet. Let today be that day. Whatever it is. I mean, I could run through a whole long list and try to guess and maybe hit whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know what it is for you. Just let it be today. Let this communion today be something special between you and God. And listen, every time, right, he tells us, as often as you do this, remember me. We'll have the worship team come. They're going to play the last song here. And as they do, take that moment, come and get your bread, your matzah, come and get your cup, and We'll take it all together. Lord, thank you for your word and, and what you've shown us and what you've done for us already. And Lord, help this, let this be a reminder to us, as you have asked it to be, a reminder of what you've done for us to forgive us of our sins, Lord. And that even today, as your kids, forgiveness is still waiting for us that the fullness of the promises that you've made to us is still waiting for us. And Lord, we know there's a day in the future when the, the, we'll experience truly the fullness of our salvation when we stand in front of you and we see your face. And there will not be another doubt, not another hesitation, but we will know 
absolutely the fullness of our salvation. And we long for that day, Lord. We look forward to it in Jesus' name.